The flight crew of a regional turboprop plane is attempting to salvage an approach on which they end up high and fast. Suddenly, a loud sound coming from the propellers takes them by surprise. In the seconds that will follow, the two pilots will find themselves fighting for their lives and the lives of the other 20 people on board. A Fokker F-50 plane was flying at flight level 180, approximately 18,000 feet, over the skies of Germany. The aircraft was operated by Luxair, the flag carrier of Luxembourg, on a scheduled service between Berlin and Luxembourg City. Luxair 9642 left Germany at 7.40 UTC, flying southwest to Luxembourg Findel International Airport, the main airport in the small country of Luxembourg. The captain on that flight was 26 years old and had 4242 hours of total time, 2864 of which were on the Fokker F-50. He was captain at Luxair for three years. The co-pilot was 32 years old and had 1156 hours of experience. He'd been flying the Fokker for a year and had 443 hours under his belt. Together with them was a 32-year-old female cabin crew. There were 19 passengers on board the 50-seat Fokker F-50. The plane was a turboprop-powered airliner, designed as an improved version of the successful Fokker F-27. It was developed in the Netherlands during the early 1980s and incorporated new advances and several improvements over its predecessor, such as the adoption of Pratt & Whitney Canada PW127B turboprop engines and a higher degree of cockpit automation. That day, the weather around Luxembourg City was poor, with cloud coverage at 100 feet over the airfield, a meteorological visibility of 100 meters, and a runway visual range, RVR, of 250 meters. RVR is the range over which the pilot of an aircraft on the center line of a runway can see the runway surface markings or the lights delineating the runway or identifying its center line. The RVR is specific to the runway and its actual lighting system, and it is usually higher than meteorological visibility, which only refers to the general range an object or light can be seen in the current conditions. The RVR value is critical in determining whether an aircraft can safely take off or land in low visibility conditions. For example, Luxair's Fokker F-50s were authorized to land with an RVR not lower than 300 meters, a type of approach called Category 2. Today, most airliners are approved for auto land operations, known as Category 3, with RVR as low as 50 meters. The Fokker F-50, on the other hand, is an old generation plane that required pilots to land manually, reaching around 100 feet above the runway. The crew became aware of the marginal weather conditions at their destination airport while listening to the automatic terminal information system, a TIS, during the cruise. The captain, who was the pilot flying, told the co-pilot that he expected to be put in a holding pattern while waiting for the weather to improve. The pilots then agreed on what their duties would be for the next few minutes. The co-pilot would have been in charge of informing passengers of the delay due to low visibility, while the captain would have contacted Luxair's flight dispatcher for real-time weather updates. Dispatch reported that the RVR was 250 meters and added that it had not been 300 meters for some time and that if it didn't get better, they would have been diverted to their alternate airport. Meanwhile, the co-pilot wasn't sure what to tell the passengers and asked the captain for advice. When he finally ended its public announcement, the air traffic controller cleared the crew to descend to 3,000 feet and gave them a heading of 130 degrees to vector them toward the airport. This instruction took the pilots by surprise, they expected to be placed in a holding pattern and therefore had not adequately prepared the aircraft for the approach. There was no time for an approach briefing, and both pilots hurried to prepare the approach as best they could. Luxair 9642 was then instructed to turn right to a heading of 220 degrees to intercept the localizer and was cleared for the instrument landing system ILS, approach. At this point, the captain decided to advise the air traffic control that in case of a RVR lower than 300 meters, they would go around. The tower controller acknowledged this and informed them that, at the moment, he had a reading of 250 meters. For this reason, 
the captain communicated to the co-pilot that, if passing the Echo Lima uniform beacon, 5.5 nautical miles from the runway, and the RVR hadn't improved, he would execute a missed approach. However, despite overflying Echo Lima uniform beacon, the captain didn't take any action. Finally, 10 seconds after the passage over Echo Lima uniform, the captain communicated to the co-pilot that he would commence a go-around, but received no response from him. Indeed, he was engaged in the completion of the before approach checklist and was not paying attention to the captain. After 10 more seconds, the air traffic controller stepped in and informed them that the RVR had been raised to 300 meters. This RVR value, which corresponded exactly to the required landing minima, triggered a sudden reversal of the captain's decision, who then chose to resume the approach, even though they should have started their descent 20 seconds ago, overflying the final approach point. The captain then had to achieve two contradictory goals as a pilot flying. Maintain a high rate of descent while slowing down. To obtain this, the captain pulled back the power levers to idle, but the co-pilot stated that it would not be enough, meaning that despite this action of the captain, he doubted the obtained sink rate would be sufficient to capture the glide path. He suggested extending the flaps and landing gear to increase the rate of descent and rejoin the glide slope. The captain agreed, but as soon as the landing gear was down, a loud noise was heard coming from the propellers, accompanied by a massive deceleration of the plane. The crew was startled and quickly tried to figure out what was happening. They were close to the ground, with no outside visibility, and their airspeed was quickly falling. Ultimately, they came to the extreme decision of shutting down both engines in a desperate attempt to stop the deceleration. The aircraft was gliding blind in the fog layer. When the crew saw the ground, they did what they could to flare the aircraft, but the impact was tremendous. The plane collided with the south edge of a road before collapsing against a nearby embankment. The main landing gear collapsed, and the aft part of the fuselage detached from the rest of the aircraft. When the aircraft came to a halt, a fire started and destroyed the central part of the fuselage. At 9.06 a witness notified the accident to the National Emergency Center. The airport fire brigade reached the site 12 minutes later and quickly extinguished the fire. They found passengers ejected from the fuselage behind the left wing. Some others were still attached to their seats. The cabin crew member was found lifeless in the corridor next to the fuselage front entrance. The cockpit did not burn and a hole was cut in the fuselage to rescue the pilots. Incredibly the captain survived, while the co-pilot was not so lucky. Only one of the 19 passengers survived the crash. It was the deadliest aviation disaster ever to occur in Luxembourg. The accident investigation was conducted by the Commission for Technical Investigation of the Luxembourger Ministry of Transport. The definitive final report was released in July 2009, seven years after the accident occurred. Both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder were retrieved and analyzed. In particular, the investigators focused on the moment in which a loud sound could be heard coming from the propellers, combined with a rapid decrease in speed. Analyzing the parameters of the engines, they came to the conclusion that this sound was due to the activation of the reverse thrust of the engines. Unlike jet engines reversers, which use hydraulic devices to divert exhaust gases forward, turboprops achieve the same result by varying the pitch of the propellers. This position of propeller blades is called beta ranger reverse pitch and directs the airflow from the propeller forward. The activation of reverse pitch in flight explained the rapid deceleration of the aircraft and why those pilots had decided to cut off both engines. However, there are safety mechanisms that should prevent the activation of this system in flight, precisely to prevent such events from happening. How is it possible that these devices failed? The technical investigation of the Luxembourger investigators, assisted by Fokker engineers, was long and complex. The Fokker F-50 has two systems to prevent power levers from being positioned below flight idle in flight. The first is a mechanical primary stop, or ground range selector, and it is placed behind the power levers. This primary stop requires a positive, distinct, and separate pilot action to be overcome. The secondary stop is provided by two electrical solenoids mounted on each engine, which allow the reverse pitch to be selected, 
when one of the sensors mounted on the shock absorbers of the left and right main landing gear detects a compression, or when the two wheel speed sensors, each one mounted in the wheel axle on one main landing gear, detect a wheel speed in excess of 17 knots. The accident flight's crew correctly removed the primary stop or ground range selector as part of the before approach checklist to select reverse pitch when on the ground. But questions remain on why the pilot flying moved the power levers to the reverse pitch position and why the secondary stop did not prevent him from doing so. To answer the first question, investigators analyzed the behavior of the flight crew during the approach. Several standard operational procedures were not applied because of the sudden increase in workload brought by the execution of the direct approach, although the crew was set to enter a hold. Consequently, there was no approach preparation, nor briefing, which might have improved the crew's performance. The above-mentioned events testify a lack of method and professionalism of the pilots in handling this unexpected situation that finally led to the unfortunate attempt at regaining the glide slope. It was not possible to prove whether the captain deliberately moved the power levers to the pitch reverse position or if it was an involuntary move. However, the flight manual clearly states, do not attempt to select ground idle in flight. In case of failure of the flight idle stop, this would lead to loss of control from which recovery may not be possible. The reason why the secondary stop did not work was explained by examining a safety report made in 1988 by a Fokker F-50 operator who discovered that the power lever movement below flight idle was possible in flight if some conditions were simultaneously met. Those were landing gear down, main gear unlocking must be such that the inboard and outboard anti-skid control channels are powered within approximately 20 milliseconds from each other, and the power levers must be below the flight idle position. If all of those criteria were met, the secondary lock was disabled for 16 seconds. Nevertheless, Fokker aircraft determined that no immediate action was required in view of the low probability of failure. Unfortunately, these three conditions occurred simultaneously on board Luxair's Flight 9642 and led to the tragic consequences we mentioned earlier. The Commission for Technical Investigation concluded that the initial cause of the accident was the crew's acceptance of the approach clearance, although they were not prepared for it, namely the absence of preparation for a go-around. It led the crew to perform a series of improvised actions that ended in the prohibited override of the primary stop on the power levers and caused an irreversible loss of control. A contributing cause was the low reliability of the secondary stop safety device installed on board Fokker F-50 models. Following the accident in 2003, an airworthiness directive was issued in order to improve the functioning of the secondary safety flight idle stop. Fokker services assured that the unintended energizing of the flight idle stop solenoids is adequately covered with these technical modifications. A criminal prosecution was launched against the captain for involuntary manslaughter and negligence. In 2012, he was sentenced to three and a half years of probation and a 4,000 euro fine. A memorial was erected at the crash site to remember the victims. On November 6, 2022, a ceremony was held there to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the accident. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and make sure to subscribe to the channel, as similar contents are on the way.